perhaps the finest fighter built during World War II. It was designed, assembled, and flown in 180 days. It was a fighter which could fly farther and faster than any other warbird it came up against. Air-to-air -air dogfight, long-range escort, air-to-ground destroyer. It did it all. They called it the P-51 Mustang. The P-51 dated from a British wartime requirement to develop an export fighter from the United States. It was powered by the Allison engine. The British were very happy with the first models, but were much happier after the Merlin engine was put in it. The Merlin engine, which was a British developed engine, was licensed and built in the US by the Packard Company. It was built to higher production standards than the British Merlin, and it performed brilliantly. Its gear-driven supercharger installation turned the P-51 into a fast and flexible machine due to its very fine high-altitude performance characteristics. This was something that the Allison engine, which powered the P-40 and the P-38, did not have. The Mustang was flown by more top aces than any other Allied fighter. The P-51 had a 37-foot wingspan with a total length of just under 33 feet. Its height was 13 feet 8 inches. It was powered by one Rolls-Royce Packard Merlin V-1650 engine. It had a maximum speed of 437 miles per hour. It weighed 7,100 pounds empty and 12,100 pounds loaded for battle. With its combination of range, speed, maneuverability, and armament, it was the premier fighter of the war. The P-51 is a remarkable aircraft uh, in, that, in that it is an airplane developed very, very quickly by North American Aviation. Uh, the the uh, chief designer of it was Edgar Schmoud, a remarkable individual. It had some of the attributes of lightweight pre-World War II European fighter design. Uh, this could be seen in its configuration, which looked somewhat like a Messerschmitt 109, an early Messerschmitt, an E-model Messerschmitt, which caused the P-51 some problems when it initially entered service. It was the victim of recognition mistakes. But it really owed a lot to the ability to take this highly successful, powerful, engine, the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, adapt it to American manufacturing technique, and then put it in the airplane. When that occurs, so that in, in mid-1943, we have the first production P-51Bs and P-51Cs undergoing flight testing and development, and they go into service by the end of the year, by, 19, by the end of 1943, at that point, the P-51 really becomes a world beater. There were other attributes of the P-51 that we don't often think of, but I think were nevertheless very, very important. One of them is wing design. Uh, if you take a look at the P-51, the P-51 had what we call a lamina flow wing. Now, in point of fact, strictly speaking, I doubt that any P-51 in service ever achieved lamina flow. One achieves lamina flow conditions around a wing only under very specialized conditions, typically those that you find in a wind tunnel, where you have a wing that, that is highly buffed, treated, waxed, polished, of uniform cross-section, where the manufacturing irregularities are very, very minimal. With a mass-produced airplane, you really don't see that. With an airplane that's in a combat environment where the wings are scuffed, somebody's, uh, somebody's scuffed it with a boot while they're putting ammunition in one of the ammunition bays for the machine guns, things like that, that's not going to happen. So what made the P-51 aerodynamically a success? Well, this lamina flow wing configuration, which was a product of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, particularly the work of an individual named Eastman Jacobs, one of the major figures in American aerodynamics, the lamina flow wing gave you very fine drag reduction characteristics that were totally unrelated to lamina flow. C 
simply by having a symmetrical cross-section wing where the thickness of the wing was moved back to about the 50% mark between the leading edge and the trailing edge, what we call the thickness chord ratio, and, and reducing that thickness chord ratio down, caused the drag characteristics of that wing to be relatively minimal compared to the kind of drag characteristics that other nations were getting off their own wing designs. It also gave you a thick uh, section uh, in the middle of the wing that was fairly thick, interestingly enough, so that you could carry additional fuel. So the overall shape here was very conducive to large volume internal fuel carriage at the same time that the profile of the wing, the airfoil cross section as we term it, guaranteed you very low drag. And that combination of low drag and high fuel capacity meant that the P-51 would have exceptional range. And indeed it did. When you put two external fuel tanks under the airplane as well, you had an airplane that could very easily fly a mission from England to Berlin, engage in combat with the Luftwaffe over Berlin, and return to England. The Mustang was the ultimate escort fighter. Bombers would leave their bases in England an hour ahead of the Mustangs. Then, somewhere over the Dutch or German border, the faster Mustangs would catch up with the bombers and relieve the P-38s and P-47s. As they moved deeper into Germany, the group of escorting Mustangs would watch every corner of the sky, weaving ahead, above, below. All around the bombers, like a screen of destroyers protecting the main fleet. They never had to wait long for another rendezvous with the Nazis. Lolita here. Watch it, fellows. 109 to 10 o'clock. They get rid of their long-range wing tanks before the fight. Then, down they go for the kill. With a touch of a finger on the stick, a camera and eight machine guns are put into action. A small camera set on the wings makes the record. Often the pictures are poor due to gun vibration, but they offer a glimpse of what happens in the instant of action as the pilot sees it. The enemy fighters are massing for an attack on the bombers, while the P-51 pilots watch every move the German pilots make. The Germans make a sneak attack on Allied bombers from behind. Gun camera film captured from the Nazis reveals how they hammered the bombers with their 22 millimeters. A B-17 catches fire and goes down in flames. This one had half his tail shot off, but is still going ahead. The Allies lose another, but they can't be stopped. The P-51s, often heavily outnumbered, engage the Germans all over the sky. Day after day, month after month, the Mustangs fight the Messerschmitt 109s and the Focke-Wulf 190s. Now these P-51s are on the attack. Two against ten, six against fifty, they block the Germans' mass assaults against Allied bombers until the Allied victory column soars at the rate of four to one.
the ever-increasing fleets of fortresses and liberators pressed onto their targets and dropped their loads. And the day arrived when a huge 8th Air Force bomber mission with full fighter escort of P-51s was flown to Berlin and back without a challenge by a single enemy fighter. But before that eventful day, the Mustangs had many missions to perform. While Allied bomber and fighter losses were less than the Germans, they were still high. More bombers and fighters and more well-trained pilots were sent each day, and the Allied fleets grew ever larger. While the Axis could not match Allied production, their first line of operational strength was maintained. The great air battle of Europe was still undecided. In February 1944, there was a sudden change. The P-51s were ordered to range wider, to seek the German fighters in the air and on the ground, instead of waiting for them to come up. The P-51 Mustang was about to solidify its place in history. A gigantic fighter battle raged across the European sky with the Germans sustaining heavy losses. 60, 80, sometimes a hundred fighters destroyed each day. The P-51s came down from almost invisible heights to make the final attack, sometimes only a few feet above the ground. German warplanes of every kind and in fantastic numbers were splashed all over the landscape of northwestern Germany and occupied Holland, Belgium, France. This was a crucial battle. Both sides were aware of the coming events with air domination itself at stake. The P-51 showed once and for all that it was the premier fighter aircraft of World War II. Certainly, the planning and leadership of the air commanders was important, even vital. But the P-51 led the Allies to victory. Many of the Germans' aircraft exploded over their own forests and housetops, or were driven into the ground. So many of their famous fighter leaders met death at the hands of Allied pilots that it shattered the morale of the Nazi pilots. The Axis defense plan was smashed. Quickly, the P-51 Mustang seized this opportunity when the enemy did not come up to fight. Down they went to blast the German planes to pieces and burn them on their own airfields, all over Western Europe and in the very heart of Germany. It was the most savage and devastating fighter attack on record, and the P-51 led the way. Returning from unchallenged escort duty and on many special missions, the Mustangs burned Nazi aircraft by the hundreds. Challenging enemy flak, 
sheets of machine gun fire from flak towers and ground installations caused the Mustangs heavy losses, four times as many as the same number of fighters would sustain in aerial combat. But the P-51 pilots never flinched. And by their courage, facing destruction in single-engine planes only a few feet above the ground and 500 miles from their bases, the pilots of these remarkable aircraft destroyed the heavily concentrated front-line operational strength of the German Air Force forever. Now that the sky was in the control of the Allies, another great opportunity became available. The destruction of Germany's transportation system that fed and supplied their army counted on to repel the Allied invasion forces. The German roads and railroads were struck with the mighty force of the P-51. These were tense days, crucial days, and both sides knew it. The Mustangs, freed by their bitterly won victory in the air, became a dominant factor on the ground. They exploded locomotives by the thousands and burned freight cars in uncounted numbers. No train in daylight hours was safe. No target too small. Not even a single railroad car. No marshalling yard a haven. Germany's desperately needed rail transport system was shattered all over the map. Bridges, oil tanks, flak towers, radio and radar stations, trucks carrying ammunition and supplies, staff cars carrying high German officials. Road traffic of every kind and description was destroyed until German convoys could only move effectively at night. The impact of this successful air war was readily apparent. Allied armies could now drive forward without having to keep one eye cocked over their shoulders, their gun emplacements unobserved. Flying this top gun was a pilot's dream and an enemy's nightmare. Few people have ever flown a P-51. Many who did never made it out of World War II. But for the top scoring Mustang aces, it must have been a wonderful ride. While nothing can replace the real thing, one can imagine what it would be like. With the help of an old World War II training film and a vivid imagination, one can head for the sky with the help of an ace fighter pilot. For the next few minutes, sit back and enjoy the ride. Let's stop shooting the breeze and get this ship off the ground. Okay, Bob. Colonel, if you'll join me in the control tower, we'll have grandstand seat. Right. See you later, children. Right, sir. Bob will give a continuous radio report on everything he does in this plane which might deviate from normal pilot procedure, even if it's scratching his ear in the middle of a loop. Hello, Mr. D. Oh, Johnny. These are the gentlemen I called you about. Colonel. Get over to where we can see things. Ah, there's Bob. Now you notice he gets in the plane from the rear. And uh, flaps are kept down to prevent anyone stepping on him. Now Bob, before he gets into the cockpit, checks the Zeus buttons on the radio compartment panels. Once inside the cockpit, he gets comfortable. Adjusts the rudder pedals, gets his shoulder harness set. Well, they should be ready by now. Charlie, let's give him a call. OK, Mr. Deeds. Hello, Army 115. This is Mines Tower. The air is all yours, Bob. Nothing expected for the next hour. Over. Hello, Mines Tower. This is Army 115. Well, here's where I start the monologue. Hope your ears can take it. I've, I've checked, checked the servicing of the ship to have an idea of the amount of load I'm carrying. The rate of climb can vary as much as 500 feet a minute, depending on the load. I close the cockpit enclosure by first pulling the left side into position, then lowering the upper portion. And I make sure the enclosure handle is locked in place with a safety latch. 
and rear hatch and felt molding is checked. He checks to see that the warning pins in the right sliding track are down. Pins checked. Starting the regular before starting engine check. Be sure that the tail of the P-51B is anchored securely, that the flaps are kept up. You see, the weight of the new Rolls-Royce engine has moved the center of gravity forward. As a result, the slipstream from the prop is liable to force the tail up. During my regular check, I make sure that the emergency boost control is in automatic, as I'm only to use it in case of war emergency for not more than five minutes at a time. Making sure supercharger control in automatic and not in low. Coolant and oil switches checked in automatic. Fuel booster pump on normal. Finish check, starting engine. Clear. The fuel booster pump draws from whatever tank the selector is on. We try to cut down on the number of things a pilot has to do. That's why the ship has an automatic manifold pressure regulator connected to the throttle. But the pilot will have to be careful under icing conditions because the automatic regulator will try to compensate until the carburetor is completely iced up. May I have the microphone, please, Colonel? Are you ready, Bob? She's warmed up, ready for taxi. Here I go. The attitude of this ship makes ground visibility very poor. So essing is necessary even more than in most airplanes with a conventional type landing gear. In order to save the brakes, use the steerable tailwheel feature. If I hold the stick at neutral, or slightly aft of neutral, the tailwheel is steerable six degrees on each side. All I have to do is move the rudder pedal. The six degree steering feature doesn't allow sharp turns. In order to make one, I simply push the stick forward the tail wheel unlocks and becomes full swiveling. However, excessive throttle or excessive use of brakes with the stick forward should be avoided to prevent nosing over. Making regular cockpit check. If in doubt, use the checklist. Every army plane's got one. Flaps up. Pool is open. Trim tabs, seven degrees, right rudder trim. Note that I switch the fuel booster pump to emergency. The pump draws from whichever tank the selector is on. Instruments, okay. Switches on main panel, okay. Checking oxygen gauge. Switches right panel, okay. Gas tanks, full. Running, Running up, up engine, engine checking, checking mags. mags. Now, I use no flaps normally for takeoff, but if I were carrying bombs or external tanks, I might use them. So to show the operation, I'll use them this time. The best settings, 20 degrees flaps and six degrees tail heavy on the elevators, as the plane will get off more quickly and give a greater feeling of control that way. The manifold pressure can be used as you need it up to 61 inches. The propeller control is fully forward for the maximum RPM of 3,000. Taking off. Keeping the tail on the ground and use of rudder trim, as I said before, counteracts normal torque action on takeoff. A bit of back pressure on the stick has to be used to keep the tail down.
thousand feet. The supercharger just changed over in a high blower. A jump seems to occur in the engine, then the manifold pressure returns to its original setting. It switches at an altitude of between 20,000 and 20,500 feet. Heading on upstairs. Twenty-five thousand feet. I've leveled off. Hello, Chilton. Hello. How is she on directional trim changes when speed and horsepower are varied? I'll throttle back and give it a whirl. The airplane is stable at all normal loadings, but the directional trim changes at low speeds as horsepower and speed is varied. However, the rudder tab corrects this effectively with only a slight adjustment, and it should be used as necessary. Normally, there is no trouble as the plane is naturally stable. That means the P-51B will remain at any altitude without adjusting the trim tabs. Less work for the pilot. Now I'm going to show her stalling characteristics. The stall is comparatively mild and occurs at approximately 95 miles per hour indicated with gear and flaps up. About three or four miles above this stalling speed, a slight elevator buffet occurs. Plane six at distance, then rolls over on one wing. It doesn't whip over as some other planes do and has very little tendency to drop into a spin. The recovery is completely normal. All that has to be done is to release the back pressure on the stick and apply opposite rudder. With the gear and flaps down, the stall would have the same characteristics as before only it occurs at about 85 miles per hour indicated. Hello, Bob. Show us a couple of dives. Okay, Colonel. Here she goes. Plane gains speed extremely fast in a dive. Tends to veer slightly to the right and continue in a dive without pulling itself out for quite a long time. overrun during the dive, does it? Not a bit. I put it at 3,000 RPM and it stayed nailed there. Any other questions, sir? No, thanks. How about doing a couple of rolls for us? Here's one to the left. Rate of roll is extremely fast, especially at high speeds. That's due to the sealed balance aileron, the final result of 14 different designs. That fast roll really counts, too. Yes, that means the pilot can disengage the enemy a lot quicker. We believe the only enemy ship that can approach it for speed of roll is a Fokker Wolf 190. Here's another dive. In the dive, the pilot doesn't have to maintain excessive forward pressure on the stick. Catch the slight tendency to veer to the right with a trim tab, if in a prolonged dive. Otherwise, the ship is positively stable in the dive. Hello, Arthur. I'm going up to high altitude and put her in a maximum speed dive to show you how fast you'll go before reaching compressibility. Okay, Bob, let us know when you're up there. Roger. Roger. Now then, while Bob's climbing, there are some points that might interest you, gentlemen. Let's sit down, shall we? Colonel? Thank you. Now, as you know, the true speed of a plane at the time compressibility occurs divided by the speed of sound at that altitude gives us a figure called the Mach number. So named after the man who discovered the relationship. Let's take an example. We'll say the plane reached compressibility at 560 miles per hour. That's true airspeed at 10,000 feet altitude. Dividing this speed by 724, the speed of sound at 10,000 feet, we get, and gentlemen, we've done this arithmetic many times before, 0.76, the Mach number. Now, that number indicates the speed a plane can dive at any given altitude. The higher the Mach number, the faster the plane can dive without encountering compressibility trouble. We believe the P-51B has the highest Mach number of any fighter. 38,000. Are you all set down there? I guess we're all set. We had enough theory for the moment, anyhow. Major, should we let them know we're still down here? Right. Hello, Bob. We're all set down here. You really gonna wind her up for us? Just you hold on to your hat, Major. Okay. Give us your indicated speed and how she acts when you get her into compressibility, will you? Roger. I'll, I'll be, be down, down in a minute. minute. Oscillation. 
continues until a lower speed has been reached. 440 indicated at that height. That's really moving. Enemy fighters will have a hell of a time trying to keep up with this ship in a dive. They really would, Colonel. I'm going to try a couple of spins. I'll do a right spin first. Here she goes. In a right spin, there is a continuous oscillation. A slight rudder buffet is present. Procedure for recovery completely normal. No trouble getting out of the spin. Probably try one to the left now. For three turns, an oscillation is present as in the right spin. Then the spin becomes stable. Recovery is the same. Full opposite rudder, then stick in neutral. Going into a sustained side slip. Couldn't hold it. I'll do another. The plane will not hold a sustained side slip. The aileron control is insufficient to hold it on a side slipping angle. The ship automatically tends to straighten out. However, it will side slip long enough to avoid enemy fire. What about prohibitive maneuvers? The usual limitations? Right. No snap rolls, inverted spins, or outside loops. Hello, Bob. How about some aerobatics? Roger. Here's a loop. You know, 
go down to the line and talk to Bob. Thank you. Well, how'd you like it, Colonel? Nice show, Bob. Mr. Deeds, I think we've got something. Thank you, sir. Nice landing, Bob. But tell me, what happens if you make a bad one, if you bounce her in? Do you give her the gun and bring her around again, or do you just ease it in? Well, if the attempt at landing is badly made so that the wing drops, or you get a bad bounce, go around again. But don't slam the throttle open, because if you're too near stalling speed, engine torque will drive you right into the ground. You should ease the power on, get the nose down, and go around again. If at the last moment you decide not to make a landing, ease the throttle open, and when you reach an airspeed of about 110 and an altitude of about 300 feet, raise the flaps by degree a notch at a time after raising landing gear. Uh, tell me, what about engine failure during flight? Engine failure during flight. Pull the emergency release handle of the cockpit enclosure so you won't be trapped inside in case it jams on landing. Lean forward when you do because the hatch might clip you on the ear. Drop your external fuel tanks. And if this time, lower the flaps. But remember, you've got to do it by hand because your hydraulic pressure is gone. Keep your landing gear retracted and land on the belly of the ship. It's no tea party, but you shouldn't have too much trouble. Oh, uh, one more thing. Get away from the ship as quickly as possible because the cockpit can get a little warm in case a fire starts. Tell me, how does she behave on scramble takeoffs? Oh, same as any other fighter. If she isn't warm, the oil has to be diluted enough to ensure proper oil pressure at moderate power. Then, as soon as the engine will take the throttle, just taxi out and take off. But apply the throttle slowly and steadily. Sudden application, as in any takeoff, causes the engine to cough and spit. How'd you like me to check you out on it, Major? What are we waiting for? Excuse me, Colonel. Bomber escort, dogfighter, ground attack warbird. Whatever the air commanders asked, the P-51 obliged with deadly effectiveness. In history's largest air battles, this Mustang rode herd on all the rest.